you mind if I share with you a, how, I, it's not really a pet peeve, but something that has the capacity to annoy me? It's, it's the subtitles that get placed in front of passages of scripture. Let, let, let me explain. So do you know what I'm talking about, by the way? That when, you're, when you open your Bible, whether it's on like a virtual app or in person, above a little section, there'll be a space and there'll be something in bold or italics that kind of talks about or labels what the next passage is about. Yeah, yeah okay, good. You should know, and I've told you this before, but let me remind you, the subtitles in your Bible are actually not inspired words, okay? Same thing with chapters and verses and page numbers. Now, those are helpful. I'm not against them. <laughs> but you'll find that if you actually pay really close attention, you don't have to be a trained Bible scholar to realize that sometimes the verses are broken up in weird spots, sometimes mid-sentence in English translations. And what's called pericopes, these little sections of scripture that get labels, like sometimes they're broken up in weird spots. Occasionally, especially in the Gospels, you'll see new subheaders where it's Jesus has just been talking the whole time. <laughs> it's like, we're, we're going to break it up here. Well, maybe he didn't want it broken up there. I almost never read them for this reason because I think they influence the way we read our Bible, which is, I think, a negative. If you open your Bible and before you read the passage, you read the subheader, you're going to read that passage through the lens of the subheader. Do you understand how that might be like scary? Because the person who wrote the subheader, the subheader was not an inspired author, not an apostle. <laughs> so we need to be a little careful. Sometimes we get this wrong. So for that reason, I most of the time just skim over them, don't pay any attention. It's just something that I do. I'm not suggesting you need to do that, but now that you know, you can do better. Say, we should question those things. This week, I happened to read them. It was by happenstance. It was kind of a uh, something that just jumped out to me because I consult, before I preach the scriptures, multiple translations just to see who people who know the biblical language better than me, how they make judgments in their translations. I think it's helpful to not just read one translation. And when I did it, I noticed just how massively different the subtitles are. Now, you probably know some of your favorite Bible so uh, stories by their subheader. They're helpful. They organize your brain. But let me just share you uh, with you the subheaders for today. And by the way, open your Bible uh, to Luke 17, uh, starting in chapter 1, and I'm going to ask you what yours is in just a moment. So in the NS or NASB, the subheader simply says instructions, which I think is hilarious. Like, we don't know what this means. We're just going to label the content, like the type of content it is. Are they instructions? They are. Way to go, NASB. The NRSV says, in more nebulous terms, some sayings of Jesus. They got the author right, <laughs> but they're even a little nervous. Like, maybe these aren't instructions. These are just things that Jesus said, as if that's really helpful for us. The NIV takes a stab at labeling the content. They call this section sin, comma, faith, comma, duty, comma. One thing to be nervous about is this passage that they label with that, the word sin doesn't appear until really late. But in the English translations, sometimes it appears before the Greek word does. We need to be a little careful. The NLT, they call it teachings about forgiveness and faith. They're, I think that's the closest ballpark so far. Does anybody have a Bible translation with a different subtitle than I just called out? No? Man, you guys all, I picked the translations that all of you read? Wow. There's diversity in this. And isn't it interesting that these people who are Bible scholars, who know the original languages way better than you or I would probably ever glean in our lifetime, and they sat together, I know this is the case, in rooms with other people, and they, they kind of wrestled over the text a little bit, like there's more than one person's thought. And so all these groups of scholars get together, and they can't even come up with subtitles that are the same <laughs> or even close. Like, the instructions versus sin, faith, and duty. Some sayings about Jesus versus teachings on faith and forgiveness. There's a lot of difference, and it's humbling to me that these folks had a hard time distilling in one line what the text was about. And let me just tell you, sometimes the text can't be distilled <laughs> into one line. We have to wrestle with it a little bit and have the Holy Spirit teach us. All this to say, our passage today, we have our work cut out for us. <laughs> 
If these Bible scholars couldn't come up with some way to summarize it, Lord, help us today. But I think we're going to come up with something helpful. Our work is cut out for us, but we'll cut something helpful off. So Luke chapter 17 comes right on the heels of a bunch of parables. And then right after it, there's a miracle story. It's kind of sandwiched in between. And that's why it's labeled confusingly. It's like, well, it's not a parable, and it's not a miracle story. It's just like this random time where Jesus gets with his disciples, like just that small group, and says something powerful and impactful. So it's going to be important for us to understand today. And like our other passages, he's on the road. He's traveling. He's headed to Jerusalem, but at this point, we're back to all the way back to the border between Galilee and Samaria. If you remember anything from the Gospels, the Galileans, they don't like the Samarians, <laughs> Samaritans. So he is going to, rather than go around Samaria, <laughs> I should change my perspective here, <laughs> to go down Jerusalem, he's going straight through it, and he has to kind of explain what that's all about, and he's going to do that by healing some uh, Samaritans in just a moment. But let's start with our passage today. In verse 1, it says this, Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them, the people who are doing the stumble blocking, to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their necks than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. <laughs> you remember this passage? We, we briefly talked about it last week because the same word to describe Zacchaeus' stature was found in this passage. Can anyone do my heart a, 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 like a, a win here? What do little ones in this context mean? Oh, come on. Say again? Well, yeah, it could be children, but he's not talking to kids in this passage. And they're not even around. But you're right, there were kids in the passage from last week. That's great. It's the same word to describe Zacchaeus, who was, remember, short in stature. But what, what else was he low in? Other people's value of him. He was a little one in the kingdom. He was somebody who was on the fringe. Somebody that other people looked at and said, that's not the type of guy who we should let in here, Jesus. You remember? from last week. And just in case you're worried that I interpreted that passage wrong and your mind was blown for no reason, N.T. Wright, who has way more authority at interpreting scripture than me, says this about this passage. This reference is to the previous two chapters. So it wasn't just in chapter 19 that this verse is used, but in the two chapters before, in which little ones refers directly to outcasts welcomed by Jesus to whom the Pharisees and others wanted to keep from entering God's kingdom on Jesus' terms. So I think we peg this right. Little ones here means people who are, like, they might have one foot in and one foot out. I, like, I want to be around Jesus. I see something valuable about him. This Christian faith thing makes sense to me. It touches me on a deep level, but I feel unworthy, and everyone's telling me I'm unworthy, okay? That is where we are. Jesus is talking about people who want to be a part of the kingdom, but the people who are already on the inside are trying to keep out. So what is, what is his, his word to these people? Don't <laughs> do that. Don't make this judgment call like you did wrong with Zacchaeus, wrong with the little kids, wrong with the blind beggar, wrong with the rich young ruler. Remember, we have a really bad <laughs> track record of deciding who's in and who's out. So what's going on here? He says, stumbling is kind of inevitable in our life. The, the word might be translated in your text, stumbling block or temptation. It's something that life throws our way that makes us feel wobbly in our faith. Anybody had one of those things? <laughs> and Jesus is saying, life is plenty full of those. If you live in this world, there are going to be things that kind of shake you a bit. And they're going to make you feel unworthy of being in Jesus' kingdom, just like one of these outcasts. That's going to happen. So, since the world, the flesh, 
and the devil are constantly trying to exclude people from the kingdom of God. They are the stumbling blocks that come. Jesus says, you, Christ follower, disciple, someone who's in the in group, should not be one of those things to people who are on the fringe. Jesus is asking us to look at our lives and be like, are we a barrier through our action, our inaction, the way we talk, the way we treat other people, to folks who would otherwise want to be a part of God's kingdom? The warning is stiff here. So there, everyone knows how hard life is. Why are you making it harder for people who want to come to Jesus? Watch your selves. The, the word here, translated stumble, which is used twice, is in the Greek, scandalon. What does that sound like in English? Scandal. Don't let your life be a gospel scandal that makes other people doubt whether the Jesus thing is even true. It really could just be that simple. Jesus is saying, look, there's lots of things that are going to happen. Like if you watch the news, people are already going to doubt God's goodness. So why is your life giving more reason to people to stay out of God's kingdom or make them feel unworthy of being in it based on your self-righteousness? This could be both sides of the coin. Don't be a scandal <laughs> that keeps other people from seeing Jesus. The world has enough gossip and treachery <laughs> and things to be offended by. The last thing that anybody who's on the fringe of Christianity needs is you to be the offender. So don't have your life lived in such a way that other people are so offended by how you treat God's good news that they doubt it could even be true in their life. And, and the, the back end of this verse, that's a little scary. Anybody want a millstone tied around their neck to be thrown overboard? <laughs> Like imagine like mafia style, somebody duct taping a, a 45 pound weight and throwing you into like Lake Michigan, right? Like I don't want that for myself and I don't want it for you. So maybe we need to look at our lives this week and see like what parts of my behavior are being an unnecessary offense to people who then don't see Jesus because of it. I mean, look at your social media posts this week. <laughs> Is this going to help people see Jesus or not help people see Jesus? If we were to change the way we did Facebook based on this verse, our world would be a lot better. How you treat your, your coworkers, family members, whatever. Don't be the scandal, the offense that keeps people from seeing Jesus. And in doubt, when in doubt, don't be an offense. Because you and I, as we've learned, are terrible at determining... <laughs> Who might be offended and who's not? Just don't do it. Jesus is saying, put down the keyboard. <laughs> Think that through again. Be slow to speak because your tongue can speak words that give life or death. Don't be the offense that keeps other people from seeing the kingdom of God. But there's a flip side to this. It's really important for us this week to grasp. We should not be the offender. But what happens when somebody offends you? Like, what's the other side of this coin? How do you handle being the person who's kind of pushed on the fringe because of what somebody says or does or doesn't do? Jesus gives us both sides of the coin. Verse 3 continues, Watch yourselves if your brother or sister sins against you. By the way, he's talking about insiders, right? people who are in the kingdom, not a fringe person, sins against you, makes you feel fringy, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. Finally, we actually have the word sin. Some of your translations may have had it before that. We, it's not in the Greek. In the Greek, here it is. If your brother or sister sins against you, what does that mean? Well, sin in the New Testament has two dimensions. There's vertical and horizontal. The vertical is a, an offense to God. Let me tell you, you can live your life in a way that's offensive to God. But then you can also live your life in a way that's offensive to other people, the exact thing Jesus has told us not to do. And when you offend people that God loves, you're offending God. Sin has a vertical and a horizontal dimension. 
So don't be an offense to God or to other people. And if somebody is an offense to God by being offensive to you, how do you respond? Jesus doesn't say ignore it. He doesn't say get trampled on and keep your mouth quiet. He says you need to address it. You bring it up. The word here is you rebuke them. You bring the offense forward and say, how would you feel? You can use whatever language, you know, it's comfortable for you. Like, this, this, this hurt me. And then what's supposed to happen? Are you supposed to do this in a way to get back at people? To, like, stab them? To cut them deep? Make them feel worthless and fringed? No, you're not supposed to be the offender, remember? It's very clear. Just one verse previous. That's not the goal. What is the goal? For there to be repentance where the relationship is restored through forgiveness. How do you handle when people offend you? Let me tell you how our world has taught us to handle it. And you, can, you can head nod if you feel like this is true, and you can shake your head, and maybe I'll be quiet if I'm wrong. Maybe I'll be quiet. Our world has taught us that human beings are kind of on the same level here. But as soon as you hurt me, and I forgive you, you hurting me puts you down a rung, and then me forgiving you puts me up a rung. What has happened? There is imbalance in the relationship. It, te- like Technically speaking, sociologists would call this a dominance hierarchy. There's now somebody who is higher up the dominance totem pole than this one, and we're talking about morality. And this makes sense. If I fall short of God's glorious standard and hurt you, and then you live up to God's glorious standard by forgiving me, then we've created a gap, yeah? That's actually not how forgiveness works in the kingdom of God. It's how the world has taught you it works. It is not how it works in the kingdom of God at all. Let me continue reading for you. Verse four, even if a person wrongs you, seven times a day, and each time turns again and asks for forgiveness. The text says repents. It's real. Then you must, what? This is Luke's version of Matthew's famous line. How many times do I have to forgive somebody? Seven times 70. What does that mean? Forever. (laughs) You always, if someone is actually sorry, and repenting and wants to see the relationship restored, you have to forgive. And that shouldn't look like them going down and you going up. That's not how the kingdom of God works. But if we just impute Jesus' saying onto the way our culture thinks, then this is going to get dangerous quickly. One offense. They come back and do it again, maybe in the same way. You like that sound effect, Danny? <laughs> But what happens really quickly? When you keep forgiving somebody and somebody keeps letting you down, the gap gets wider and wider and wider. Soon enough, you're looking down at them from your high horse, your moral pedestal, and they are like a rat. And you come to this conclusion eventually, like there's nothing they can do to make up this divide. I'm so high up there and they're so far down here, I can't come up with any possible scenario in which they repay this and balance the scales. So what do they deserve? Punishment. That's the only other way to get it, right? If they can't give me what I need, I'm going to take a pound of flesh to balance the scales back out. A lot of you think that's how God works with you. That's exactly opposite of how Jesus is saying God's kingdom works. Forgiveness doesn't put you up here and them down here. In fact, this is going to blow your mind. This is why I needed the headset today. Forgiveness works like this. <clears throat> You're on the same playing field. So we're all humans, created the image of God. Yeah? I sin and fall short of God's glorious standard. I'm down here. What does Jesus say? Forgive them. What does that look like in hand gestures? Humble yourself and forgive them. You make yourself the servant. This is what Jesus does. Humbles himself all the way to the cross for your transgressions. He puts himself below you and he's telling you to do that in the same way that God forgives you time and time and time again. 
He's saying, do that for other people. When they come and ask for forgiveness again, what does that do? So here's the first one. I messed up. I'm sorry, it's okay. I forgive you. I messed up. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgive you. When you mess up again, it puts you back on moral, pl- like it puts you back on, wow. This is, the, this is a theology of grace and hand gestures. God always restores you. He doesn't go higher and you go lower. When you say, I'm sorry, forgive me, he brings you back. You're a son or daughter. You don't lose your crown. In the same way, when someone hurts you, you serve them. You don't put them in your debt because God doesn't put you in his debt. Now, when Jesus says this to people, forgive people, even if they do it again the same day, or in Matthew, forgive them seven times 70. How easy is that to pull off? It's not very easy. And if you feel like this is an impossible standard today through hand gestures, you're not alone. Here's how the apostles respond in Luke. Verse 5, show us how to increase our faith. Because when Jesus says you got to keep forgiving them, they're like, I don't know if I got that in me. Okay, Jesus, if, if you're going to expect that out of us, then we're going to need like an extra portion of your grace to pull it off. And sometimes we pray for that when we're having a hard time forgiving somebody like, God, help me out here. That's reasonable. But listen to how Jesus responds. This is what's really crazy. He doesn't say, okay, you need more faith. Here's some more faith, whatever that means. As if faith is some like tangible substance that could be like thrown out like cards or something, right? We're dispensed from a vending machine. He didn't say, okay, this is hard. Here's more faith. This is what he says. Verse six, if you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, remember this? You could say to this mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. Quick quiz. When anybody read this version or the other gospel accounts where it talks about mountains being thrown into the sea, did any of you as little kids read that and then go home and try to develop force powers in your bedroom? I have enough faith to move this plant, <laughs> right? And no, no one, I did that kind of stuff. That's not what's going on here at all. The, the apostles say, increase our faith. And Jesus says, it's not the size of your faith that matters. It's the size of your God. You don't need more faith. You don't need more time. You don't need more maturity. You just need to obey. Ouch. Because if you're somebody who's struggling with unforgiveness today, like somebody has hurt you and like you feel like they're in your debt and you don't know how they could ever possibly get out of that, you're probably like the apostle saying, God, if you want me to forgive them, I'm going to need more faith. To which Jesus today is responding, your faith isn't the problem, it's your obedience. This is something that's expected of people who inhabit the kingdom of God. It's not for discussion or for debate. It's simple. It's not the size of your faith that matters. It's the size of your God. You need to obey. In fact, uh, in this passage, it says you must forgive. If someone comes to you, even sinning on you again the same day, you must forgive. What does must mean? (laughs) Do you have a choice in a must? Like, no. This is an expectation. This is like the bottom rung of what it means to be a believer. Whoa! Whoa! Yikes, that's tough. Now, Jesus illustrates this for us, which is helpful because just being told you have to forgive no matter what, and if you don't, like you're in trouble, that would be hard to, I think, stomach for most of us. So Jesus is gracious enough to illustrate it. Now, this illustration has not aged well, okay? So don't get offended by the illustration. We'll work through it, but I want to give you Jesus' words. Luke 17, verse 7 says this. Suppose... One of you has a servant plowing or looking after sheep. Will he say to that servant when he comes from the field, like he's had a hard day, he's coming in, come along now and sit down and eat? The answer rhetorically is no. Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant Because he did what he was told to do, the rhetorical answer is, 
No. What? That's crazy enough. Now here's his call to you as a Christ follower. So you also, when you have done everything you are told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Oh. <laughs> this one shook me up a little bit. For, by the way, let me get this out, out of the, the way so we can continue. This passage is not giving you license to treat people who are in the service industry like they are objects. It don't matter. Remember that when you go out to eat for Mother's Day. I've been on the receiving end of Mother's Day crowds. It is rough, okay? Treat your server like a human being today. This passage is not giving you license to be higher than somebody else. That's not what's going on. In fact, Jesus is trying to figure out how we bring everybody back into balance. Second, I don't think that Jesus utilizing the master and slave relationship in the ancient world means that he's justifying it, okay? Just be, this happened in American history. Since Jesus said this, we can have slaves and it's fine. And they should do their duty. That's not at all what's happening. What Jesus is doing is using a cultural norm that every single person he was talking to understood. He was just speaking their language. Everybody knew the dynamic between master and slave. So he's going to use that to communicate to us a timeless truth about yours and my relationship with God. This has nothing to do with power over other people. It has everything to do with how you stand before a holy God. Make sense? Anybody seen the show Downton Abbey? Man, come on, guys. The pop culture. Shane will put her hand up in the back. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, I've not seen many of them, just partly because when Shane had discovered it, I was still on my master's degree, and she didn't have a lot of time to watch it, so she'd watch them on Saturdays when I was gone working at Crack Barrel all day. <laughs> I'd come home, and an entire season would be gone. But here's what happens. It's, it's like the Victorian era, uh, I guess a little bit later than the Victorian era, uh, British aristocrats who have a big manor, Downton Abbey, and then they have an entire host of people who attend them. They're like footmen, servants, I don't know all the different names of the people. But if you watch one show, you'll see there's a very serious distinction. There are people who are members of the household, and they are treated with that dignity and honor, and then there are people who serve them. The servants never sit down until the masters go to bed. Like, they don't say, I'm hungry, and so while they're serving their the, you know, the, the household's dinner, can, like, can I sit down and have a meal with you? That would have just been like fired. Like, no, that's not what you do. What they do is they take care of them, they get them dressed for bed, then they either go to like this reclining room, which is they need a different room to recline in, or they go to bed themselves. And at that point, once the masters no longer need attending, the servants go downstairs, they have everything prepared for them, they eat the same meals, and they have a grand old time eating together before they go to bed, okay? Now, if the illustration of Jesus or the illustration of Downton Abbey offends you, congratulations, you're an American. That's not derogatory, okay? What it means is in America, we've been taught, like, we, we, we take care of ourselves first. And we give out of our surplus, not out of our lack. We don't serve anybody. That's part of the reason we rebelled, <laughs> When, when Jesus says that the servant doesn't ask for a seat at the table, our American ideal says, I'm going to need a seat at the table. Those aren't bad things. But if you read this passage with 21st century American idealism in your mind, you're going to misunderstand what God is trying to teach you. Our ideals aside, this isn't about a dominance hierarchy. This is about us looking at ourselves and seeing if we have the humble heart that God is asking us to serve him with. This pa in this passage that Jesus is sharing, the question is, by serving the master faithfully, has the servant put the master in his debt? What's the answer? No. Because servants serve because it's their duty. It's their nature in ancient Near Eastern terms. We don't have to agree with that. We just have to understand the illustration. Jesus is saying, when you forgive somebody, you're not putting them in your debt. In the same way that we don't expect a servant to put the master in their debt when they do their duty. What is he saying? Forgiveness 
is the duty of all people who pretend to serve God. I'll illustrate it this way. Me and Pastor Bradley have been reading a book uh, called, what is it called? Care of Souls. That's right. See, he's on cue. We've been reading it and talking about it every week. It's a book that helps you develop a pastoral habitus, a way of life where you serve God well and serve your flock well. There's an illustration in the book that jumped out to me, and I'm going to share it with you. It's the idea that pastors are sheepdogs, okay? It wasn't Bradley's favorite illustration, but I'm going to make it important. Uh, however, I'm going, to, I'm going to switch the illustration from sheepdog to cattle dog, because when I was in high school and college, we had a cattle dog, <laughs> uh, Maggie. Aww. Yeah, there you go. Now that you've done your duty awing over my childhood dog, <laughs> one of them, that's her duck, by the way. She loved her duck. It was like you put a bottle in it and it crinkles, but she just liked to throw it around. So I'm going to switch it to cattle dogs today just because I had one. That's all. You don't get a say. Now we're going to lose, obviously, with sheepdog reference, the good shepherd reference, but I promise we'll make up for it. In fact, I'll just tell you what the book says first. Uh, the, the, past, or the, the author is trying to make the point that pastors are sheepdogs at heart. They are people who, just like the sheep, listen to the good shepherd's voice. But they also have the role as sheepdogs of helping the sheep who don't hear well or respond well stay in line. What do sheepdogs do? Whenever the shepherd asks them to do something, they do it, and they do it happily. Sometimes they get messed up and beat up and tired, but at the end of the day, they look back at their master, their tail is wagging and their tongue is out because they've done their duty. They've been an extension of their, you know, their master's will and heart. They've been the sheepdog that they were supposed to be. The, the point of the book was, as pastors, you're that sheepdog, and you might get beat up spiritually, but it's your job, and because it's what you were made to do and who God has formed you into, you should be ready to go the next day. And you should be, at the end of your day, sitting at your Father in heaven's feet, just enjoying his presence because you've done what you were supposed to do, no matter how complicated or hard it was. So let me switch this into your everyday life, because most of you aren't pastors and probably won't be throughout your life. How would this matter for you? Well, let's switch it to cattle dog land. So my dog was an Australian cattle dog, and I actually watched a few videos this week of how cattle dogs do their work. Cattle dogs do their work. Because... In the sheep and sheepdog world, the sheepdog is relatively close to the same size as a sheep. Now, sometimes sheep can be pretty big, but in general, it's close in size, and sheepdogs are faster and more agile. So they just like whip back and forth doing their job, and they can keep the sheep in line because they're all just petrified all the time. Cattle dogs, they're not even close to the same size as the animals they herd. They're short and stocky, at full speed, slower than cows, and they're really not that agile. I watch um, Maggie smash into walls all the time, right? Full speed, big thuds. Uh, not all that agile and not as fast as, as cows. So how do, how do they manage this? Well, they work in concert usually with another cattle dog and a cowboy to keep the cows in one like close-knit unit, which limits their speed because they're moving as kind of like a fluid group and their agility because they're kind of smashed together. Now, of course, there are cows on the outside who have a little bit more freedom, and they don't necessarily love being herded. Cattle dogs aren't that fast. They're not that strong. So they just kind of work by you know, running back and forth, being in the cow's eye. The cow knows that the, cow, the, the dog can do some damage if it really wants to. But if a cow is getting out of place, it really has no choice but to come up and nip at their heels. That's why another name for cattle dogs are healers, right? Like, hack. You know, I'm going I'm to get you. If you get out of line, I'm going to get you. And it keeps the, the cow on edge. Now, if you're a cow and you are much bigger than this dog that's biting you, how are you going to take it? <laughs> well, maybe if you're part of the group hysteria, you're okay. But from time to time, cows can be really bullheaded. <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> And what happens occasionally is the cow will not take kindly to being nipped and will try to kick and sometimes land kicks on cattle dogs 
or at minimum, like turn and run at them, try to headbutt them. Sometimes they'll even bite them in return, okay? <laughs> like, like, you're going to bite me, I'm going to bite you. It's like a toddler fighting together, a couple of toddlers fighting together. So cattle dogs can take some punishment. They might get stepped on, they may get kicked, they may get run after and scared by things that are bigger than them. But at the end of the day, they sit down once all the cows are in their pen with their master and they wag their tail and they're grateful to be with their buddy. What happened throughout the day is no longer like in their brain. The next day when they get up, they might be a little bit sore, but they go out to work anyway. And by the way, if you take a kick from a cow, you're going to be a bit sore. <laughs> now, suppose you and I are supposed to live our lives like cattle dogs, which I actually think is the call from Jesus here. If a cow gets out of line, what are you going to do? Honestly, I feel like if a cow kicked me, I'd be like, I'm going to go lay down in the shade now. I'm done. <laughs> like, I, I'm, I'm, that, this was the wrong, I'm not made for this, God. <laughs> I'm going to go lay, sit this one out. Does that make the cowboy happy? No. What if old Betsy, who always brings up the rear of the herd, just like you wish she was in the front so all the other cows would push her forward. She's always in the back. Maybe she's a little bit slower, a little bit temperamental. And you're always trying to have to hurt old Betsy. But old Betsy knows you're coming. Like you keep making eye contact with her and you're like, whoa, <laughs> right? I must stay away from old Betsy. Why? Because she bites back. She bites back hard and it hurts. And it like makes me want to roll over and just lick my wounds for a little while. So if you're getting day after day, pestered by the same cow or group of cows, what are you likely to do? You're likely to try to shift your attention to some other cows and say, hey, cowboy, those are your problem, right? Have you done either of these things in your Christian walk? People who've hurt you, where you just say, I give up. I'm done. I'm going to lay in the shade. This isn't my nature. <laughs> or when people perpetually mess with you and, and come to you and they hurt you and they offend you and you're getting the bar separated and separated and separated, eventually you're like, I'm just, I'm done dealing with Betsy's. <laughs> I'm going to turn my attention to somebody else. God, you got them. What do you do? Cattle dogs don't even have any of those thought processes. They get up every day and they herd. Why? Because they're an extension of their master's will. And when they get kicked, it just happens sometimes. They get up and they keep going. They're bruisers. And at the end of the day, they get fed, and they don't expect a promotion. Like, I dealt with Betsy today. What do they get? A pat on the head. Good job. You did your job. You don't get, like, a, you don't get to ride around in a limo now. You don't get, you're not a, you get to be part of a tractor team or something. Like, no, you're going to run out and chase some cattle tomorrow. Why? That's your job. That's what I want you to do. I think Jesus is calling all of us on forgiveness' sake to be cattle dogs who every day get up and we're willing to do the master's will. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it takes some bruises. But we don't get to sit it out just because it hurt too much. And we don't get to stay away from certain people who just because they annoy us and we have a hard time forgiving them because we feel like the debt is going back up and up and up. It's your design to forgive. So embrace the cattle dog life. When you forgive, you're not scoring points with the master where you get to age out of being a cattle dog and retire to this beautiful land of shade. You know what you do in that land of shade? You get bored because you're bred to herd cattle. Today, if you're having a hard time forgiving somebody, like I get it. It's, it's hard. But Jesus is asking you to do it. You know what you need to do? You need to, you need to take the punches or the kicks or the bites, or the stampedes that are going to come your way and do your Father's will. And at the end of the day, you don't get to say, God, you're in my debt now. We don't get to do this. God, I forgave Betsy. I'm up here and you're down here, so I'm going to need some blessing. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's what Jesus is saying. You're, you're forgiving and doing your duty doesn't put God in your debt. Nobody should be in your debt. You always humble yourself. Humility, that posture, links the top passage with the bottom passage. Don't be somebody who offends other people. Be humble enough to be nice and kind. And when somebody offends you, be humble enough to say you forgive them. And even the scale is because God does it for you time and time again. When in doubt, 
Don't be offensive. Not a hard takeaway. When in doubt, forgive. Both things are expected from obedient followers of Christ. You must do these things. Your faith isn't the problem. Your obedience is. And all of this hard work that you do, and it is hard work sometimes, doesn't put God in your debt. What it actually should do is continually highlight how much you owe him <laughs> that you can never pay back. Because God forgave you out of the riches of his grace and his mercy. You didn't deserve it. You could never work your way back into his grace. And Christ balanced the scales for you. Be a cattle dog who does the Father's will. Don't be unnecessarily offensive. Don't bite the wrong people. <laughs> and then forgive those who bite back. Paul exudes this lifestyle. I'm going to conclude by reading to you a passage from Philippians where he talks about his own heart posture to his, you can imagine, cowboy or shepherd. Ephesians 3 says this, yes, everything else is worthless compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You can imagine that as sitting next to the master at the end of a hard day's work. For his sake, I had discarded everything else, counting all things as garbage, including the debts we hold against other people in unforgiveness, so that I could gain Christ and be one with him. I no longer count my righteousness through obeying the law. God's not in my debt because I've lived right. I became righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to what? Suffer with him. Sometimes work is hard and painful and forgiveness sometimes feel like suffering because they hurt us and it hurt. Like it's real, it's tangible. There's a problem there. But there is a problem with sin and thank God Jesus dealt with it. And now we get to offer it freely to others. So I will suffer, offering forgiveness for whatever, offering mercy, even to the point of sharing in his death. How much more humble can you get? So that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection of the dead. I want to do my father's will. And I want to wag my tail no matter how many bumps and bruises I get along the way. Because the goal is to be with him forever. So I'm not going to be offensive when I don't need to be. And I'm going to forgive even when I might not need to. Because it's the Father's will. How would your life change today if you were less easily offended? And more quick to forgive? Doesn't everybody want some of that? Like, Wouldn't your life be better? So the problem today is not the amount of faith you have. It's the size of your God. And let me tell you, he's plenty big enough. So I think today the question is obedience. Are you willing to be less offensive to people who are on the fringe where your behavior might tell them that they're excluded from the kingdom of God? And are you willing to be the type of person who forgives debts and pushes people back in to the good graces of God by forgiving those who repent? Wouldn't that be good? Let me tell you, it's more than good. It's a must. It is a must for those who call themselves followers of Jesus to forgive 